Good morning, family. Let's worship together this morning.
we're so glad you're watching this morning. We're going to sing a song about how great God is. Join in and sing with us. Thank you for that, Adam. I'll, I'll be glad to sing with you anytime. I'm David Frady. I'm children's pastor here at the Heights. We're so glad you've chosen to worship with us. And um, this weekend, of course, is 4th of July weekend. And uh, as we celebrate our freedom as Americans, uh, we're going to be continuing to study about faith. And our bottom line this week is that Jesus is a gift to everyone. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And also, remember this month as we learn about faith, that faith is trusting in something you can't see because of what you can see. Uh, that's very important to us. Now, we're going to have a challenge for you. The challenge this week, we're going to rinse and repeat. We're going to go back to the top of what we did last month. And that is that we're going to encourage you to sit down as a family this week, and we're going to encourage you to talk about what you learned about faith. And when you do that, take a picture, post it on Facebook, or you can use the hashtag Heights Focus on Faith, and uh, we'll get a, collect all those. It'll be an awesome thing. So let me say to you, you don't have to be mom and dad with just kids. It can be older people like, say, maybe Pastor Raymond when he comes out here in a few minutes, and uh, his family can do that, and so be sure to take part in that. Also, I want to tell you about coming up on Sunday, August 2nd, which is uh, a Sunday, August 2nd, between 4 and 6, we'll be having what we're calling Stop By, Move Up, and Chill Out. Now, what in the world is that? So here's the thing we're going to do. So on that day, you come by between 4 and 6, and that's the whole church family, okay? We're celebrating that week those children that are moving up, and we'll celebrate what grade they'll start in the coming school year. So, like, kids that will be moving into kindergarten, we're going to celebrate them. Kids are, kids are moving to sixth grade, we're going to celebrate them. And kids that will be moving into high school and graduating, we'll celebrate all them. Whole church family come by, okay? So what we're going to do is when you come in, you'll get a, a, some water balloons, and you can throw them at your favorite staff person. So Adam Rose, right? Adam Rose, throw them at Adam. And um, also, after we do that, on the way out, you get some shaved ice for everyone in the family. How about that? So it would be a great time of fellowship, celebration, and during this time that things are kind of um, kind of weird, let's say, it'll be a, a little bit of a, a normalcy for us. So plan on that Sunday, August 2nd, 4 to 6, Stop by, move up, and chill out. Now, get ready to worship. Adam Rose and the band's coming right back to lead us in worship. out. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain.
Bless you, Jesus. Change. Yeah. 
you that in your presence, Lord, we, you change everything, God. God, we've been singing about it all morning. God, the freedom that we have in you. God, the chains fall because of who you are, not because of anything we do, God, but who we can be in your presence, Lord. Thank you for that, God. Thank you for the freedom that we have in you. God, we praise you. We bless your holy name, God. Great. Hope y'all having a good 4th of July uh, weekend. And uh, here on this 5th, we thank you for joining us and uh, being with us during this time of worship. Uh, I think that as I look at things, uh, I'm very thankful that God is so good to us all, even in the midst of bad times. I appreciate so much David, though. He keeps referring to me as old. And he said on August 2nd, we're going to have this... Uh, drive through, throw water balloons at everybody, and he's trying to get me. I'm, I said I'd be in it, and I think he ought to be the one that's targeted, but I won't say that. I'll just, you just, you know, bug in the ear kind of thing. But I hope you'll join us and be a part of that great time. Thankful for him and Justin preaching uh, for me a couple of weekends um, uh, just to, to let me uh, take a break there and uh, think and pray a little bit, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, Charles Dickens uh, wrote one time, I think, a really appropriate, something that's very appropriate for our times. He said it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And I think that's true right now in our country, in America, and some would even say in the world. It is truly the best of times. There's a lot of great things that are going on. A lot of people have asked me about what's going on. It's just a judgment of God. I really believe that it's a prelude as God is preparing to bless and do something that only can be explained by him, that's what I believe. I think it is the best of times, and we're going to see that soon. And it's also the worst of times. We've got a lot of things that are going on. America, uh, despite its imperfections, its failures, and even its sinful attitudes at times, is still the greatest country that I know of. And as I've traveled throughout Europe, former Soviet Union countries, I know that people there have talked about how uh, they love America and uh, they love the medicine that we have and the doctors, etc. Uh, it is a great country. Is it perfect? No. Is, is it at times bad? Yes, it is. The thing, though, I think that is truly... Uh, heart, disheartening is that those good times can never overcome the bad times of America. And the reason for that is in the majority of churches across America, uh, as well as those who don't even acknowledge God, there are people who are still dead in their sins and there are people who are still slaves to their sin. And as long as the heart, which is wicked, so wicked, God said in Jeremiah that no one can know it, uh, what else can you expect? And so we're in this series called Faith Is, uh, and this is the, appropriately on July 5th, the fifth week of that, and the text is so very appropriate uh, following July 4th uh, because uh, I think that the true freedom 
is a freedom that can only be brought about by grace and faith. And so if you have a Bible, I hope you'll join me and open it up to Ephesians chapter 2. And I want to read verses 1 through 10. My emphasis will be on verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Paul writes this, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the, the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 are the key truths of this letter Paul wrote to the Ephesians. It is arguably uh, no other passage in the New Testament that is more known, more loved, and more memorized among Christians except for John 3, 16. I remember when I was an RA leader uh, uh, right after being a believer in Christ uh, up at Stanley and uh, we carefully split open some walnut shells and kept them in, one, in two pieces and hollowed them out and we typed John 3, 16 on little slips of paper like a fortune cookie, rolled it up and put it in the middle of that and glued those things back and we handed those out as the gospel in a nutshell. That's how powerful that verse is and it went very very far, but Ephesians 2, 8, 9 uh, is certainly the, uh, equal to, if not close around in the minds and hearts of many. In verse 8 that of this passage we just read, Paul begins with a purpose clause that points back to verses 1 through 7. Verses 1 through 3 that we read give us the bad news. Bad news? Yeah, the bad news of sin. That all of us, every single person, were dead in our sin, and thus we're slaves to sin. And as a result of that, we are condemned in sin. But then in verses 4 through 7, he comes in and broadcasts the best news, the good news of salvation. He tells us that we have been made alive in Christ, that we have been raised out of the dead with Christ and we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's our place is already set. There's a place for us and it's as if we're already sitting there. And this is the difference that Jesus Christ makes in a person's life. In sin, we are lost, depart from God and headed for eternal separation from him in what the Bible calls hell. In Christ, we are saved and on our way to heaven in his presence because heaven is both a place and a presence. Christ is who makes heaven heaven and his absence who makes hell hell. But as we celebrate this great news of the gospel, we have to be careful that we don't forget how we got from where we were to what we are. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, just a confession here. I've been a pastor a long time and a Christian uh, for a long, long time too, since 1974. I constantly remind myself of where I've been, not looking back, but just reminding myself 
of the utter misery I found myself, the predicament that I found myself in with no hope at Hopeless Feeling, and how I got to where I am with the family that I've got and the beautiful people that I've got and know here in, in the churches I've served and particularly here at the Heights. Uh, and so as we celebrate the good news of what Jesus Christ has done, we have to be careful we don't forget where we've come from and how we got to where we are. So in verses 8 and 9, Paul, under the, again the inspiration of the Spirit of God, explains it. He says, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So the bottom line here for Paul is, is that in, in this text is really stated in three words, and that is only God saves. Only God saves. Uh, and he is echoing what the Old Testament tells us anyway, Jonah, you remember the reluctant uh, missionary in, jo in Jonah 2, 9 says, salvation belongs to the Lord, and that's true. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 teaches us that salvation is the act of God and not the act of human achievement. So salvation, uh, as we learn in God's word, is true. Salvation is an act of or the act of a loving, merciful God. Look again at verses 4 and 5. But God, rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins or trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. That word saved at the end there is an ancient word because uh, it means to rescue from danger to save from death uh, and harm. To expound just a little bit further, salvation is deliverance from the death and the bondage and the condemnation of sin that he describes in verses 1 through 3. Uh, and so we need to keep that in our minds. But it is just as much about what we're saved to as it is about what we're saved from. You see, we have new life in Christ. Verses 4 through 7 declare that we are made alive and raised up and seated with Christ. So how does this miracle of salvation, how does that come about? Well, verse 5 answers, this is by grace you have been saved. We've been saved. In fact, uh, you can know it. And it's interesting, we can't always see this in the English Bible, but the grammar of the Greek in this phrase, uh, which is uh, an interesting thing, the passive and it's perfect and it's paraphrastic, uh, indicates a completed act in the past with ongoing benefits today and tomorrow. So that if we translate it according to how it is actually in that text uh, literally it would be by grace you have been completely saved past tense done with the present result that you're in a saved state of being in other words we have been saved we are saved we will be saved forever that's what paul is saying in that one phrase with that one word it is that joy that we have we're saved uh, in there, we've been saved, we are saved, and we'll be, we'll be saved forever. Uh, and we're always in that state of salvation. Verse 8, then, uh, it repeats and expands the great truth that Paul has just said. He says this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Salvation is, through, is by grace alone through faith alone. Salvation is by grace alone through faith faith alone salvation is by grace alone uh c.s lewis who i really like to read and i quote him a good bit he said the thing that makes christianity unique is the doctrine of grace and that is true it does separate us because every other religion teaches people how to reach up to god but christianity 
comes along by declaring that all of us are sinners and broken, and because of our sin and brokenness, we are too short to reach God in any way. But God, in his mercy and his love, has reached down to us to reconcile us to himself by his righteous life, atoning death, and the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. So verse 8 states his term, in, in, in his truth in just very simple, a simple way. By grace, you have been saved, set free. That's what saved is. It sets us free. Well, what's grace? Well, you know, there's an acronym that went around for a long time. It says God's riches at Christ's expense. I like the one that says God's rescue at Christ's expense. It is God's unmerited favor. In other words, it's something that you can't earn. Grace is God's scandalous love. Uh, Walker Armstrong and myself did a series of sermons a couple of years ago on the scandalous grace of God. And, and it really rocked my world as we worked together and prayed together and looked at this. Grace is scandalous. It really is. Uh, grace is God. Uh, and it, it is his redeeming sacrifice even while we didn't deserve it. Romans 3, 23 and 24 says, For all, that's every one of us and everyone before us and everyone that's coming after us, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Is it any wonder that one of the all-time favorite songs of all believers is Amazing Grace? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. And that was written by John Newton, who was, uh, you know, a, a guy who was born to a very godly mother, but his daddy was a sailor, a very ir 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 irreverent kind of uh, uh, guy, uh, vile, uh, and he was a sea captain, and he was always gone at sea. His mom died when he was six years old, and he turned out to be like his dad. He was a vile slave selling captain and he didn't care for any man uh, other than himself and then he came to know Jesus and when Jesus came you know, in his vileness in his ugliness of what he did as a living when, when Jesus came uh, his life was forever changed and he became both a, a pastor and he became a uh, uh, one who uh, would fight against slavery uh, with all his heart and all of his soul. It was there that we know. I mean, uh, you, you've done more. I mean, you may think you've done more enough than send you to hell a thousand times, but I'm telling you the same grace that saved uh, John Newton is the same grace that could tra change you and transform you if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. And so you want to run to the cross. This is what, it, if you want to be free, you're living in a country to an extent it's free, it's getting less and less as each day goes on. But if you really want to be free no matter where you are, it is freedom from the inside out that is brought only by Jesus Christ. Run to the cross, trust in his shed blood on the cross and his righteousness he was without sin, became sin, and trust him to save you. That is real freedom, and it is a, a way that we live. So salvation is by grace alone. It is by faith alone. That's what the Word says. It's by faith alone. Verse 8 says, by grace you've been saved through faith. That is a, a, an interesting phrase. Salvation is by God's grace, not by faith our faith, uh, but grace is received through faith. Uh, grace is the source of our salvation. Faith is the means that we obtain that salvation. Uh, it is powerful. Faith is 
grace is the foundation of our salvation. Uh, grace is the foundation of our salvation, and faith is the, the means and ways, the agent uh, of salvation. So what is faith? Well, it's best to begin and think what faith is not. It's not just mental assent. It's not just saying, I believe. Uh, because, you know, the old, we've used it. It's become trite in so many ways. But, you know, you set a chair up and you say, I believe that chair can hold me up. Well, anybody could say that. But what if you sat down in that chair? That shows whether you believe it or not, right? Then that's where it really comes when you sit down there. It's like when I went, took my first plane ride. Uh, I was scared absolutely to death. I was in Louisville, Kentucky, was flying home from up in Louisville to do a funeral down here. I'd never flown before, and I, I remember shaking like crazy. And a man looked there and said, first flight? I said, yeah. He says, uh, just get on there. You believe this plane can fly, don't you? I said, yeah. He said, just go in there and show me. And once I got up in the air and made my trip, I've been flying ever since. It's, it's not just mental ascent. It's not just believing the right things. They'll come in up and say, well, I believe this and I believe this. You can say, I believe there's forgiveness of sin. Then why are you keep living in the past chains of your sin? I believe that we should treat people as we want to be treated. Well, why do you treat people this way? It's easy to say I believe biblical revelation and yet it not be seen in the way that you live. It's not even personal determination. I'm determined I'm going to do them. There's a lot going for that. There's some people who get determined in their mind, and they can make achievements beyond all belief. But that's not faith. It's not just being feeling really emotional, chill bumps or that warm, uh, easy feeling inside. And it certainly is not the positive confessions that are being taught here in America is if I can just speak it, then I'm showing faith. No, that ain't faith. That's not, that's not what faith really is. Saving faith is biblical knowledge that leads to a, a abiding trust in Christ and that results in spiritual transformation that can be seen. Faith is not passive. I said the other week that pay, faith is not passive. It's a verb. It's a call to action. Faith is, is something we do. It's seen in our life. Um, uh, it, it doesn't contribute to the fact that God's going to save us because of this or that. It's by grace you've been saved. Grace does it all. But faith receives what God has, believing God is, and he has created all things from nothing. We believe him and we stick with him. There's no such thing as a self-produced faith. And I'm hearing a lot of people today who are saying they're saved and then they live any way they want to because God is so loving, and he is. You trust who you trust because of what they have or have not done, right? We trust every day. We experience faith. You know, we, we go and, and we trust people. I mean, when you sit down at a restaurant, you're trusting that people are going to be good with your food and not do something crazy with it, right? You're trusting in that. You're trusting when you go to a pharmacist and, and they call in a prescription that when you get there, what that pharmacist put in that bottle that says take twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, you're having faith in that person. So, there's, But there's no self-produced faith. You know who you trust because of what they have or have not done, and you know who you don't trust. Who, uh, and you don't trust them because of what they've done or ha have not done, Right? I mean, how many of you have ever said, I wouldn't trust him for nothing? I wouldn't trust, no, no way. I don't trust, I don't trust her as far as I could throw her. You may have heard that. And, and so it is with saving faith. Faith that saves is about the worthiness of the object you're putting faith in, not the work of the person believing. Uh, it, it's not the size of, of your faith, how strong it is that saves you. It's the object of your faith. Please don't make a savior out of your faith. One of the things that worries me a lot today, and, and worry in a urgent sense as a shepherd or pastor, is a number of people 
who talk more about faith than they do Jesus. They talk more about faith than they do Jesus. It's as if they have made faith their, their God, their Savior. You see, Jesus is the object of saving faith, no other. So we're saved by faith alone. Remember in Acts 16 when Paul and Silas were in the prison, they started singing at midnight to praises to God, though they were in chains. They were praising God because they were free. You see, that's what I'm saying. Grace set them free, and though they had them in chains in a prison, they were singing praises unto Almighty God. And, and it shook that whole prison. And when it did, the uh, jailer came and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What, what do I need to do to be saved? And in the 31st verse of Acts 16, Paul and Silas looked at him and said, Believe on the, in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And I'm so thankful that that is the gospel, that Jesus Christ came and gave his life for our life to pay the penalty of sin, which is death, was buried and rose again from the dead bodily, uh, and ascended to the Father, and his salvation is efficient for those who have faith and trust him. All we got to do is trust what God has done uh, in there. I was reading long ago, I was trying to think if it was reading, if I was reading or listening, I listened to a, a lot of different people that, I, that are dead and gone that I really liked hearing preach, but there was a man that had uh, seen a tent set up uh, and heard they were having a revival. He didn't know what a revival was. But one day in a local grocery store, he ran into the preacher of that revival who quickly moved in and was sharing with him about Christ. And he didn't want to hear none of it. He really didn't. So he went out of the store and went on home. And in about a day or two, he had been thinking about it. He couldn't get it off his mind. And all of a sudden, he got concerned. Man, I need to know. I need to know Christ. I I need to know. So he made his way down. He was going to look for this preacher and see uh, if he could find out more. When he got there, there were all these men out there taking down the tent. And so he walked up to one of the men that was helping take down the tent and fold it up, and he, he, uh, he told him there, uh, he just asked him, he said, what can I do to be saved? What can I do to be saved? And that, the guy who was taking down the tent he was talking to said, you can't do anything, it's too late. And uh, this man became just, he, he was almost a look of horror on his face, and he was really concerned about it. Uh, and he said, what do you mean? How can it be too late? And this guy who was taken down the tent looked at him and said, there's nothing you need to do. It's all been done. Jesus did it all. All you need to do is to believe it. And that is true. It's belief. Believe in me, Jesus said. So salvation, secondly, is not a human accomplishment either. Ephesians 2, the first part of verse 8 says, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right? That's a positive look, uh, uh, outlook on the nature of salvation. The rest of that passage gives us a more negative look about what salvation is not. And he says this, and this is not your own doing. That's an underlining statement. There's a, it's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, salvation is not about me and you and, and some work that we've done or some accomplishment we've done. And Paul emphasizes the fact that only God saves. And he uses two negatives. The first, he says, it's not your own doing. Notice that, it's not your own doing. Verse 8 says, by, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God. How do, you, how do you know you're saved? You know, I've asked a lot of people, a lot of people that question. How do you know you're saved? And I'm telling you, even in the body of Christ, in church after church, churches I preach revival in, churches that I have been a guest speaker on Sunday morning or uh, whatever, I ask people that question, and they begin with, well, I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, and I've done this, before they ever get to Jesus. 
I've been at the deathbed of many, many people who I've asked, uh, are, you, are you a believer? Have you believed? Yes, I have. Well, if you, if you, if you stop, uh, your heart stops right now and you're standing before God, he asks you, why should you, I let you in? What will you say? Oh, I'm, I'm a good, I've done pretty good. You know, we've got the old story that went around. I know when I was a teenager, I heard it all the time on the big revivals they put on TV. There's these big scales up in heaven. God's standing behind them, and he weighs everything you've done in your life that's good and everything that's bad. And if you've done more good than the bad, you get in. And that is a lie. That, that is the enslavement that's going on in the church. It is the belief of even those outside of the church who believe that somehow it's our own doing. And to believe that you can do these things and you're going to be saved is to walk in a false gospel. Verse 8, again, of Ephesians 2 is clear. And this is not your own doing. It's not of yourself. It's not a human virtue. It's not some performance that you do. It's not some accomplishment that you uh, bring off that c can save you. Uh, it's not. You remember in John 3 the story of the Pharisee, one of the most religious men named Nicodemus that came to see Jesus? He was a Pharisee. He, he was a religious man. He, he knew the first five books of the Bible by memory. And he came and began to kind of brag on Jesus and we know you're a man sent from God because of all that you do. He's bragging on his works. And it was almost as if he was waiting for Jesus to turn around and say, boy, you're really good. I like what you're saying. But in John 3, verse 3, Jesus looked at him and said, truly, truly, I say to you, talking to Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, and so... We contribute nothing. I had a professor one time named Dr. Frank Tupper, and I saw where he had just died about a month ago, and I'm saddened by that. A lot of people uh, thought he was so liberal he wouldn't really listen to, but when I had him as a theology professor, Christology professor at Southern, he would take me aside and warn me about certain books that I had chosen to read he wanted to make sure that I didn't go off the deep end and really get off in a tangent believing things I shouldn't believe. And the last words he ever spoke to me, he was actually agreed to be a reference for me on my resume when I graduated. But the last words he said to me was, I want you to believe, I want people to know through you and they will that we do believe the Bible. And as much as I believe, as much as I appreciate that, he made a statement though that I think I've never gotten over, and it's still appropriate today. He said, people can be born stupid, but they have to work long and hard at ignorance. And I think that is really good because that's what I see going on today in all realms. Because how many of you know you had no contribution at all to who your parents would be, when you would be born, where you would be born, what country you were born, you had, you had absolutely nothing to do with your conception, who your mama was, who your daddy was, and who your birth, and who, how you came out of there. It, it, you had nothing to do. It, you, you had nothing to do. You contributed nothing to that. And we've made it such a big thing. And we've taught our kids it's a big thing. It's, it, we have contributed nothing to our physical birth in the world. And guess what? According to God's Word, you and I contribute absolutely nothing to our spiritual birth. That's the reason it's important because people are enslaved to sin and they're still dead in their sins because they're still trying to work their way to heaven. Living right won't save you. Doing right will not save you. Doing good will not save you. I remember witnessing to a man that I loved very, very much. And I was with him. He didn't want to hear it. He told me, I don't want nothing to do with that Jesus stuff or nothing else. I said, why not? He said, well, he said, I don't cuss. I've never said bad things about other people. I try to be good to everybody I can. I love my mama and I love my daddy. I've been an Eagle Scout. I've done all those things. I don't see a need for it. 
You see, he, in his mind, if I'm living good, if I'm doing the right things, I'm in. But it won't. It won't save you. Getting baptized won't save you. Baptism is a testimony to the people who are present. Of your, You're giving your testimony saying, I was a sinner. I was broken. I trusted Christ. I'm saved. So I've died to my old self and sin and buried with Christ and raised in newness of life. Baptism won't save you. It is a testimony that you are saved. Joining a church will not save you. I cringe when I think about the number of people who thought because they came to a church, and, and, and whether it was regular or every now and then, I cringe when I think that they justify their, that they're saved by their part of a church, and now they're dead and separated from God. I cringe at that. It makes me almost nauseated. It really does. Giving money won't save you. There's a lot of things. Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. You see, faith is understood here to, to uh, show us our response by which God's salvation is received. If God's grace is the gift and the ground of salvation, then faith is the means of by which it's appropriated. I say, yeah, I want, I'm willing to receive that. Uh, you repent of your sins. I'm receiving that. It, it's not a work in itself that earns you your salvation. It is response which receives what is already being done for us in Christ. We receive it in, in, uh, that salvation to ourselves. The bottom line is that salvation is free. It's a gift that we receive, not a reward we earn. You can't earn a gift. You, you don't buy a gift uh, in that sense. You can't win it. It's freely given or it's not a gift. Uh, that's how God saved us. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. So nothing that you and I could ever do, think about it. I don't care what good you and I do, individual or together. None of our good could ever compare, could ever compare with what God's Son, one and only Son, Jesus Christ, made on that cross, the sacrifice he made on that cross. Nothing can compare to that. And if it, uh, and it offends God, I think, and sometimes drives him to almost grief to eat that we would have, be the prideful people to believe that we actually could be so good to match his perfect holiness. Salvation must be, you see, it has to be a gift of God. And he goes on, he says, salvation is not according to works, which we've been talking about, right? Verse 9, he comes as not the result of works so that no one may boast. You know, he, it's almost, he's stating again what he just said. But it's really a whole lot more than that. It's a statement that explains why salvation is not yours and my own doing, and it has to be a gift of God. You see, salvation is, is about the righteousness of God. God is perfectly holy, and we're not. And the holiness of God demands that sin be punished by death. I'm telling you, there is a movement going on within the church where people are saying that uh, they could not serve a God who would punish individuals, especially if they punished them for eternity. But I keep going back to who are we? We're making God in our image rather than recognizing who he is. But the Bible says that guilty sin sinners are doomed to suffer the wrath of God in hell. How can we, how can we acquire, how can we get uh, the, righteous, um, the righteousness that we need uh, to satisfy the holy justice of God? You see, the gospel is that God provides what he demands in the bloody cross of Christ and in the empty tomb on that Sunday morning when Jesus walked out bodily. We are saved through the perfect righteousness of Christ. And Paul emphasizes this over and over again. It's not a result of works. Salvation is not your own doing. Listen to Romans 3.20. He says, For by the works of the law... 
no human being, no human being will be justified in his sight. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. He says the purpose of the law, the Ten Commandments, is to make us aware of our sin, our brokenness, our inability to attain to what God's standard really is. And so as faith and grace are connected together organically, grace and works that are opposite the ends of the pole. In Romans eleven six, 6, Paul says, For if it is by grace, and it is, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. If salvation is by grace, free gift of God, then it cannot be the results of works. It can't. Now, here's the rub in our day that still, I think, enslaves us to our sin, and this is it. We've got a cheap grace. We're, we're offering a cheap grace, a, a grace that, that, that says that, you know, you don't have to do anything. Uh, you, can, you can do the things you used to do. You can, you can do things, don't matter what it is. You live like you, like you want to. You trust Christ, you're going on. I, I just think that is an error. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul go, concludes this and says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, we're not saved by good works. Listen, we're not saved by good works. We can't wake work in our way to heaven. We're saved to good works or for good works. That's what we're saved. Uh, salvation is through faith alone. But if you've really got saving faith a uh, 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 true saving faith, you know that's th th that it's not alone. It's always accompanied by the evidence that you have received the grace of God by good works that demonstrate that that profession is real. Good works only prove that we're saved. Now listen, folks, there's some people in our churches today who believe that being a Christian is only about services on Sunday and services on Wednesday. And even then, if you can just hit one uh, uh, every now and then, one a couple of months, because we got a lot of things to do in a lot of places, we're, gonna, we're good Christians. And that is not the teaching of the New Testament. The teaching of the New Testament is that while works don't accomplish salvation, that doing good works for the kingdom of God is a result of, of, uh, of that salvation is work, is works. So why is Paul so, man, he's just hammering us about this truth that only God saves. Look at verse 9. Not a result of works so that no one can boast. Salvation is all of grace so that it will be all God, so that it will be all for his glory. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Listen to what he says to the church there, and it exemplifies the same today. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring, about th bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Listen to me, folks. When you get to heaven, you're going to find out something very clear. John Stott said it very clearly. He says, we're not going to be able to strut around in heaven like peacocks because heaven's going to be filled with the exploits of Christ and with the praises of God. I guarantee you there's not going to be anybody in heaven who's got their thumbs under there and say, I knew I made it because I did this and this. No, it is Christ alone through his grace, 
through by his grace and through faith there's going to be no self congratulations when we get to heaven what we've got to do is allow ourselves to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ to know that we're really saved stop trying to work our way in receive God's grace repent of your sins recognize I'm a sinner I'm too short and broken to reach God on my own I have no chance and to turn in faith and receive what Jesus has done on the cross that is salvation in itself to trust Jesus his death his burial his resurrection and you do that while you can and as you will as you develop and realize I really am saved I I am trusting in Christ and Christ has saved me it, it doesn't matter what I've done back here he saved me I once were those things but I'm not now we will begin to sing Psalm 34 1 and 2 with David I will bless the Lord at all times his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul makes its boast in the Lord let the humble hear and be glad do you know Jesus do you really know Jesus you trying to make me doubt pastor no I'm just wanting you to be able to answer just like that yes I know I am if you were to die right now and stand in the presence of God and he said why should I will let you in what are you gonna say ah well you you're loving God you're letting everybody in is that what you're gonna say we're all gonna be with you you're gonna look at him and say well I thought we'd just die and, and turn to dust and I didn't realize all this was gonna take place are you gonna look at him and say you know wow I I've done this and this and this I've been a pretty good man I've been a pretty good woman I've not really done any awful awful things uh, are you gonna look at him and say that because I'm gonna tell you if that's any of those are your answers you're doomed not because God wishes you to he said he wished none should perish but all should have come to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ you've chosen to ignore what God is saying and right now if that's you and you know that's the answers you'd have to give you can turn away from your past beliefs what you thought were good things and some of the things you may have thought bad some of the things you thought were ugly things it, turn away from what uh, from Google salvation or cultural salvation and today place your trust in Jesus Christ it is by grace you're saved through faith faith and grace is what sets you free from your sins your failures your misery it is it is faith and grace through cry in Christ that you and I are able to keep even when we're knocked down to get back up we get knocked down we get back up we get knocked down we get back up why not because we're so determined because even the most determined finally give out of strength but you don't give out of strength and quit when Jesus is Lord of your life and that is how grace and faith really set us free do you know him if you don't listen everybody is sitting down in here and you may be sitting at your home my thing is is right now just everybody bow your head and you're bowing if you have if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven if you if you can't look Jesus in the eye in heaven and say and him say why should I let you in you say because I've turned from my sins and trust you alone would you do it right now if you would I'm just asking in this auditorium if people stand up uh, others just stay seated if you want to trust Christ stand up right there where you're home just raise your hand up they may not be anybody in the room where you're watching just God but raise your hand up I want to know Jesus as my Savior my Lord I want to be forgiven of my sins I want to know that I know I'm going to heaven when my last breath comes and if that's you right now I want you to pray with me you just pray it you pray it the way you want to pray it but listen to me just pray this way Jesus thank you for loving me tell him that thank you for loving me I realize right now that I'm broken and and sin, and a sinner and I'm far too short to reach you in anything I could ever do but I know that what I could not do tell him what I could not do you did Jesus 
You took my place on that cross. You paid the penalty of sin. And you died and was buried. And you beat death. Tell him, you beat death. You walked out of that tomb. And you went to the Father and you're coming again. Tell him. And right now, with what faith I have, I receive your grace. I receive your grace. And I ask you to save me as I trust you. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I trust you, Jesus. I exercise faith in the sense that I am open to receive the free gift of your grace. Thank you for saving me. Tell him that. Thank you for saving me. Listen, right where you are, everybody still pray. Those of you that prayed that prayer, I, I want you to let us know. I mean, you can, you can go out of here today. We'll we get you an ink pen. So you write your name and say, That's, I, I prayed and received Christ. If you're doing this uh, a live stream, I don't care what part of the country and where you are. Listen to me. The most important thing is that you know Jesus. And if you do and you're trusting in Christ, my prayer is that you'll let us know. There's a comment section. You can just put, I'm trusting Christ as my Savior and as my Lord today. And, and thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and listen, we're going to be doing a baptism pretty soon. And if, if you have made this decision, be willing to come and to say before all those who will witness and go into these waters and say, I'm dying to self and sin and be buried with Christ and raised with Christ, you let us know and we'll add your name there. But we want to talk to you make sure you know about Jesus. For others of you that are in this auditorium, you may be seated, by the way, but others of you that are in this auditorium and others of you who are watching, you may be a believer. You say, I'm a believer. Do you really know Christ? Is there evidence? Are you, are you, it's because you're saved and you've trusted Christ, do you find yourself wanting to, tr to, to work for Jesus? Do you find him want to serve him? Do you find you want to worship him? Do you find you want to give your abilities and your talents to Christ? Or are you so busy living life full for your own sake? I'm just telling you, you say, Pastor, you're getting hard now. Yeah, I am. Because I'm telling you, he has saved us for good works. We're not saved by. And those works are the proof text that you and I have truly come to know Jesus. And trust me, while we may be in a semi-shutdown, there's still work to be done for the kingdom of God. And I pray that every single one of you that are listening to me, right now, just make a new commitment to your life to say, God, I'm yours. I, I want to I wanna be used by you in any way I can. And, and that you'll make a commitment to, through faith to live the life that Jesus died for you to have. And if you're willing to do that, I'm just asking you to raise your hand up in here today and at home, raise it up for God to say, raise both of them up. Just say, God, I'm a believer, but I'm, I'm coming back to you. I'm coming all in. I'm putting all in. I'm getting some skin in the game. And I pray to God that through the witness of this church, there'll be people who know that Jesus Christ transforms lives. That God, you love us with a love we can't even comprehend. I praise you for this Sunday. I praise you for every decision that's being made. I praise you for the song we're fixing to sing together about how good you really are because you are. And I praise you, Father, and give you great praise right now for everything you get to glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Join us and our praise band as we sing. me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God you're so good tell him he's good so good God 
sing that one more time.